We're here to share with you inspiring stories that bring to life all the little and big ways that people bring more love, joy, laughter, and humanness to everyday life. Our focus is the hunt for those little moments that refuel the human soul and reminds us what life is really all about. I invite you to sit back, enjoy the moments, enjoy the stories, the adventures, and the journeys. back to another episode of What the World Needs More Of. My name is Jarek Robbins. I'm your host on What the World Needs More Of. I am excited for a very special guest that I've just been introduced to. His name is Kirk. Kirk, thank you for joining us. You're very welcome, Jarek. Now, we're going to dive straight into the question of the show, and the question is, what do you believe the world needs more of? Oh, that's A-W-E. Um, I feel in my own life and in my own experience of, of life and of, of people, of relationships, of nature, that uh, the sense of awe toward living is something that is desperately needed uh, and certainly was very, very important. It was key to, to my own uh, ability to uh, not just get by, but to, to thrive. And by awe, I mean uh, the humility and wonder or sense of adventure toward living. If you think about what it means to be on an adventure, uh, whether it's you know through the woods or through some uh, cityscape, let's say, and it conjures up, often it conjures up a great sense of discovery of, of the unknown. Um, every moment becomes focused and and often poignant, you know, uh, sharp. And your senses are awakened, your, your feelings, your thoughts. And uh, there's a, often a sense of anticipation, some anxiety often goes along. Thrill and anxiety often go along together. But it's very powerful, very powerful to have that openness to what's unfolding before you. I, I love that, and I agree with that. I think it's something to have that awe-inspiring feeling, that deep wonder. And like you said, the deep wonder and humility and a sense of adventure and just daily living is a very, very special place to come to. Um, yes. I, I, I'm... I'd hope that some people maybe naturally arrive there early and quickly, uh, but I think for some of yeah. us, it, it takes experiences to actually lead us to that realization of how special it is when we finally discover that moment and that feeling. Uh, yes, or, or it's a rediscovery, because I think we often feel it as kids, but then it gets, it gets tamped down by conditioning and rules and regulations and fears that adults often pass on to us, but are also that are, that are natural as a part of living, mm. or certainly uh, traumas can can uh, you know suppress that ability to feel free like that, to to wonder and to uh, be in a kind of discovery mode. Mm -hmm. um, but actually, I think the greatest threat today is uh, what I call the, the machine model for living. Mm. And this is what I really elaborate on in my uh, new book, uh, The Spirituality of Awe, Challenges to the Ro Robotic Revolution. Um, the machine model for living or the efficiency model for living, it's basically uh, an emphasis on speed, instant results, and appearance and packaging. It seems like we're moving more and more toward a world where... Um, the, the quick fix is just uh, pervasive. 
it's it's true in in my field of psychology you know with kind of shorter term quicker often quicker interventions because they're they're more convenient for people and and in some ways they're easier to uh, mechanize if you will mm. we have uh, for example apps for anxiety and depression uh, many things to sort of fit conveniently in, in people's uh, very uh, hasty day-to-day world and lives. Mm. Uh, you know, we have medicines to change people's moods uh, fairly quickly. I mean, some of these things are great. I, I'm not trying to, you know, paint a bleak picture of all of these by any means. Uh, it's just the extent to which so much in our daily lives is about uh, quick fix, instant result, uh, appearance, packaging. And you think about how many people are wedded to their smartphones and, you know, they have these uh, instant sort of connections with other people through Snapchat, you know, images that provoke or evoke people. And, um, the, the Facebook relationships, uh, you know, bombarded by advertising and and uh, getting more and more used to uh, getting answers, you know, quote answers to our, our problems uh, right away. Mm-hmm. So uh, there's both great things about that and, and some really scary, I think, disturbing things. And And one of them is that perhaps we're losing our capacity to be more fully present hmm. to to moment to moment life, and they're therefore uh, less and less capable of experiencing the, the sense of awe toward living, at least the deeper sense of awe. I think. Hmm. And what are I, I think that there's other questions normally later in the show that we ask, but what are some things that help inspire the ability to stay present and cultivate that sense of awe for people? Well, I would say big picture thinking for one, um, to some degree, uh, religion and spirituality can promote this. Uh, One of the more I would say secular spiritual examples that I use is if we just think about uh, what's going on, you know, between us right now, we're having a conversation uh, through electronics, through the phone, Um, you know, in in our rooms, you're you're in a studio, I'm in a room, and and, uh, we, we think, well, this is, you know, fairly conventional having a conversation on the phone in our rooms. Uh, but if we really notice more deeply what's going on, we're not just having a conversation on the phone in our rooms, uh, you know, on a ordinary day. Um, if we think about it more deeply, we're having a conversation in our rooms uh, on an ordinary day uh, that is rooted on a ball that is uh, whirling around the sun at 60,000 miles per hour that is nested in a galaxy that is hurtling through the universe at 60,000 miles per hour. I'm sorry, at at, uh, 1.2 million miles per hour, it's my understanding, to a destination that's completely unknown, you know, from an origin that's completely unknown. So it kind of depends on how far you you take out the the idea of every every moment you're experiencing everyday life and what you're noticing. Um... There's just there's a lot more there, and uh, for me, I mean, that's it's both a little anxiety provoking, which I imagine it is for many people to have that bigger picture thinking, to realize 
how we're connected to something much greater than ourselves. But it's also wondrous and fascinating and and really uplifting in so many ways because it it takes it takes one out of our sort of narrow identifications with everyday life and gets us in touch with the more of who we are we're participating in something incredible and just thinking about that can can be helpful i i believe so i work with students and people in <clears throat> various conference settings and so on to try to cultivate a greater presence to to the moment and to the relationships to to others for example um, by helping them to be more aware of uh, let's say how they're they're both sitting there in the classroom but uh, connected with something much more that's going on much greater than themselves and what, what kinds of thoughts and feelings does that bring up or helping them become aware of you know the passing nature of time and life which is happening at every moment um, if if you realize that it can also really focus your your energy your mind on the uh, the details the subtleties the feelings of the moment um, you know being able to be open to wonder and surprise at every moment or as many moments as possible can also lead to lead to this bigger picture thinking and sense of awe. You, know, you, you think you might have a predictable conversation with somebody you're going to a party or something and uh, maybe you even know the people you're going to see and you're thinking oh it'll be the same old thing you know same tired uh, people that I know and, you know, small talk or whatever. But what if you approach that situation by kind of bracketing all the, those assumptions and just go in as fresh as you can and, and try to be open to, wow, something different might happen here. And not only that, maybe I can make something different happen here in my discussion with this person or in what I notice, or in what I notice with someone else. So these are just some examples. Are these helpful? They're very helpful, and I, I appreciate you sharing. I, I think as an audience, we might want to know more about you and how you've come to these conclusions and what led you there. And so I'll, I'll ask another question, which is, what do you feel your wow factor is, and what are some of the life moments that help shape it and bring all these discoveries and, and tips to life? Well, for me, actually, a lot of these realizations came very early through, uh, unfortunately, a, a great tragedy in uh, my family background. I kind of tore open the routine fabric of living, if you will. Uh, when I was close to three years old, my seven-year-old brother died. Mm. And uh, as you can imagine, this caused a, a great shattering in, in my family, uh, especially with my parents. Um, it uh, kind of put my mother out of commission for you know several weeks, which is so understandable. It's, it's hard to imagine uh, what she was going through or my father. But uh, anyway, I ended up... Uh, spending time with my, my grandmother for a period of time. and uh, it, it just It's like one day you're kind of, things are familiar and, and known, uh, you know, the, the smiling parents to greet you in the morning or, you know, the, the usual uh, breakfast talk or whatever. And 
the, the, the usual mood, which is pretty even keeled. And then the next, the next morning, uh, people are in a heap of tears. Mm. And that, that was actually one of my earliest memories was uh, my parents uh, crying on the couch. And uh, in any case, uh, so it was, it was quite uh, uh, an explosion in my own life, too. Uh, you know, I didn't know what was going on. I was a pretty terrified kid uh, pretty quickly. Uh, and I went through a really uh, scary period. Uh, it was a very, uh, a very worrisome time. I, my, I know my father was, was concerned that I was going to kind of slip out of reality, if you will, because uh, I was so scared. I would see uh, monsters and witches in, in my window at night. You know, I had night terrors. Uh, I had crying jags for periods of time. Uh, I'd, I'd, I'd be uh, sometimes, you know, very, very uh, argumentative and even sort of explosive in my mood. Anyway, my parents uh, wisely took me to a psychoanalyst when I was about five years old, believe it or not. And uh, actually, it's because my, my mother was very tuned into this. She went to an analyst herself. And uh, she really felt that this would be helpful, and I think it was probably one of the most important uh, contacts I had in my life because the guy, I don't remember much about the guy. He was probably middle-aged, um, except that he he was rock solid. That's what I do remember as a sort of body memory, a feeling, uh, that he was he was fully present with me, and he was stable and solid and was able to hold uh, and support the upheaval that I was experiencing, the, the, the turmoil I was experiencing. And I think this was extremely important, this, this uh, ability to be contained and to learn what containment means, something about that, even at such a young age. And so I, I moved very gradually uh, from a, a place of abject terror and paralysis and fearful of so many things, including germs and so on, uh, to gradual intrigue about the world and what had sort of ripped open and about life and, and death even and uh, the unknown uh, and, and eventually to a kind of... Uh, wonder and even fascination with this trip we're on, you know, um, I developed an inner freedom, I guess you could put it that way, whereas before it was really clamped down and, and terrified. And you know how we get in our bodies like that when we, we, we get constricted, when we're afraid. So I was gradually able, able to open up and it, 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 like a movement from terror to, to very incremental wonder. And this, after a period of time, led to an ability to, well, an interest in, I would say, uh, in, in discovery. And one of the main ways that uh, this manifested was through my interest in science fiction as a kid. And I was growing up, when I was growing up, uh, this was in the early 60s, I'm 62 now, um, we had great uh, science fiction shows. You, you may have heard of you know, the Twilight Zone and Outer Limits and these One Step Beyond. Mm -hmm. uh, I really related to these shows because they spoke to me. Uh, the, the, I'm sure part of it was the scariness of the shows, but but also the wonder and uh, one of the sort of uh, prototype typical scenes for me was in uh, one of the really early Outer Limits shows that I think uh, is very uh, good as a metaphor for what I'm describing. And it was about a, a monster, an electrified monster that invaded a radio station 
that was run by uh, Cliff Robertson, famous actor at the time. And um, it it like sucked up energy from the radio tower, and, became, and it grew, it became bigger and more powerful, and it kind of it broke out of the radio station, and it started to uh, rampage, you know, through the, the town, through the streets, and um, like many B movies, you know, it had the classic uh, ending where. Uh, the townspeople all gathered in the center of the town, and the, the military was called out, and they, they had their guns poised, you know, to to take this thing down. And so this electrified monster, you know, 60 feet tall, finally gets to the center of the town where all these people are, and it looks down at them and, and says, put down your guns, go home and contemplate the mysteries of the universe. <laughs> and that was that was the end of the show. <laughs> I mean, it's incredible. Uh, th th that's an exact quote. I'm, I'm positive. Uh, but you think about that, I mean, it, it really was portraying, and these shows often portrayed, how, you know, we, we can be so terrified of that which is other, radically other, and foreign and unknown, and yet uh, that unknown being or person may hold secrets or insights that uh, could enrich our lives, that could expand our consciousness in some way. And uh, I think that's what this creature was trying to convey, and that's what the writers of the show were trying to convey. Of course, I didn't know that when I was eight years old or whatever, but at some intuitive level, I, I felt like it was speaking to me that, yes, I'm, I'm terrified of, of this hole in my life created in the wake of my brother's death. And what does that mean, you know, as far as how long... I'm going to live, or others live, or my, my parents. Um, how is life so crazy that these things happen? What does it, what does it mean to be lost in life? Well, it brought out the flip side that, yes, those are all very scary and and you know unsettling. But the other side is that. There are many possibilities in life, and that maybe staying open to those and staying, you know, more in a state of wonder can lead to something uh, larger, uh, as I said, more enriching or insightful than what you experienced before, you know, than the, the tried and true path, so to speak. It's true. And when you're in those moments, and it, it, it could be easy to shut down, to stop wondering, to get caught up in that machine living, what, yes. are, what are some tips that can help you you stay open? I, you said thinking, yeah. you know, big picture thinking, being open to an experience of awe. But if mm -hmm. something happens that would normally shut a human down, is it... Right. Is it just that big thinking and just being open to it that'll bring you back out? Or are there, are there other things someone can do to also cultivate that state? Well, it depends really on how shaken somebody is. I mean, mm -hmm. obviously, if somebody is, has just experienced a traumatic event or something very jarring, it's hard to be, you know, instantly open to life. Um, uh, people are, are very fragile at that point. So uh, often I would say some very uh, grounded, uh, concrete intervention could be helpful, like maybe just helping a person to collect their breath, you know, or uh, have a good meal or uh, have somebody supportive to be with them. Uh, or... Uh, if uh, worse comes to worse, you know, some uh, take some kind of medication that that could 
help them get through the night or the week or what have you. I didn't have any medication. I, you know, for for better or ill, I actually think it was probably good that I that they didn't have such you know fixes in those in those days. And, yeah. and I mean, I was fortunate in a way. I was very fortunate that I made it through. Not everybody would have made made it through, but I had some great support around me. But in any case, uh, yeah, so there, there are concrete things that would need to be done just to get somebody in a place where they're able to be more present hmm. to the world. I think another, and then, another, yeah, another, go thing, ahead. another thing that popped up in your story, which was interesting, is, is contrast a lot of times brings people back into wonder. And, hmm. you know, I, I, was, I was just telling this story uh, a few weeks ago. It was interesting. Um, I, I was working with a, a company that had hired us and all of a mm -hmm. sudden there there was friction and and it was like wow why is there friction and it, it's just because of the way it normally is and the way it was and then i i took my wife only a few weeks later to india to go see the taj mahal for a weekend for our, our anniversary oh, and then when we fun. got when we got back we worked with another company and mm. the same exact situation happened except for there was no friction anymore and I mm. thought, what changed? And the only thing mm. that changed was the contrast that we had just been next to. Ah. And all of a sudden, the perception that created that that friction was gone. It, and it was replaced with ah. just gratitude in the moment. And I, I think what's interesting is your experience of finding contrast, for just I'll call it contrast, it could have been something else, but finding contrast yeah. through science fiction, uh -huh. all of a sudden, helped reduce some of the friction that was in that moment. And I, I don't know if that'll be useful to people listening. Hopefully it will. But the, the, the piece of in, sometimes in those moments, contrast. I had a friend who we interviewed um, a few episodes ago. She was sharing a story where it was her second time being a mom, but her first time having the privilege to mother. Uh, she had a full-term loss of pregnancy. And, and she found out right before she was about to push through labor. Hmm. And she said it was devastating. I said, what helped? And she goes, this is going to sound so silly, but the little video game on your cell phone called Pokemon Go saved my life. Wow. And I said, what? The one where you <laughs> chase digital fake monsters around the park and try to capture them? She goes, yes, that one. As, as silly as this sounds. I said, how did it help? She said, it gave me a reason to be outside in the sunlight without having to think about my pain. Huh. I went, Oh, and, and it was interesting because when I look back, it came back to that contrast frame as well, where the contrast of her being out in the sunlight instead of in home, boxed up, thinking about the pain and the contrast of being able to just breathe air and, and what you're talking about to, to have wonder, to be outside, to be curious about where this little monster is and what, how to get yeah. it. And, and, and it's, you know, to some extent, a distraction from the pain. But to some extent, it's a little bit of freedom, and, and like you said, that that grounding, fresh of or breath of fresh air, just in that moment, for enough to get you know your footing set again, and then yeah. to go back and actually do something with the pain or the hurt that was there. You can't ignore it; it'll just bubble right. up and fester. You can't blame it. You got to do something right. with it. Um, but it, right. but it's interesting. I I just noticed that. I don't know if again. Hopefully, it's useful oh. to people listening. But that contrast frame seems to help people resettle sometimes. Yeah, I like what you're saying a lot. I, it also sounds like a kind of priming, yeah. a, a priming that people can go through maybe uh, that can help them meet a circumstance hmm. in a little bit more of a grounded way. Um, I, it also brings up the, the classic story of Viktor Frankl. I don't know if you're Yes. If you or your listeners are familiar with uh, Man's Search for Meaning. I'm um, a huge fan personally, but please share for, the, uh, for everyone listening. Yes, well, that, that whole emphasis on attitude, to be able to have an attitude of, uh, of awe and wonder, if you will, uh, of inner freedom, uh, and being able to tap into one's imagination in the most dire and even dehumanizing circumstances, and certainly no one would, would wish those circumstances on anyone, but 
uh, no one in their right mind. But uh, Frankel showed in Man's Search for Meaning that even in the Nazi concentration camp, uh, he was able to, uh, in some way, get in touch with the more of who he was and of what was going on than the immediate, extremely dehumanizing and uh, brutalizing circumstances of being in, in that uh, in that barrack in the camp and he did this through tapping into a memory as I recall of he and his wife and kids on a family picnic on a beautiful day a sunny day and they're all gathered around in the grass, picnicking together. And, you know, despite all the, the you know, detritus, uh, God knows what was around them, you know, the smells and the, the pain, the, the torments uh, that he experienced and that his uh, mates experienced, if somehow having the, the, those glimpses of that memory and and having the capacity and and the courage to choose to connect with that memory helped him to survive to to get through mentally in these most dire of circumstances now obviously that won't work for everybody probably very rare that a person would be able to have that kind of inner freedom to experience you know the more of life in such a situation but he gives us a clue and, and a great instruction about how how much range we have to take attitudes toward a whole variety of situations, you know, by by using using our imaginations, using our memories, um, recognizing that we can, to, to some degree, to a significant degree, choose our attitudes toward situations, even though we may not be able to change the situation itself. And that's partly what I was getting at when I was talking about you know, anticipating the same boring party, let's say, that you're going to, or whatever it is you're doing, some task, some job, uh, you know, we, we tend to lock in to certain assumptions about what we're about to experience instead of really trying to stay as open as possible to something different that might happen and something different that we could even bring to that circumstance. So maybe that's similar to what you were describing by contrast. Does that seem to it does relate? It does. I think it very well connects. It it's it's that piece of their. It brought a different part of them to life. It allowed them to access a different part of their being, which again yes. can change their perception or their attitude on what yeah. is going on because now they're seeing it from a different place. And like you said, in that priming, they've primed themselves differently. Because when you go yes. for a walk and take a breath of air and get some sunlight, you're going to be a different version of yourself to handle this situation than if you were stuck sitting inside in darkness, not feeling good at all and not moving or breathing. So just, exactly. just that simple adjustment completely allows you to then adjust your entire attitude. And people like to say, you know, attitude makes the difference. It does. And the way yeah. you treat the human body can adjust your attitude. If, if you're not getting good sleep, you're not eating food, you're not moving or breathing. Um, it's it it becomes more and more difficult to actually have a good attitude. <laughs> yeah, no, absolutely. But I, like and I, I think, yeah, go ahead. I was gonna say, like you said, Mr. Frankel says that concept of even when you're in one of the most dire situations, the ability to take it and figure out the meaning you can associate that then brings about that shift. And I, I think all of them are kind of going at the same task from a different angle. And saying, yeah. you know, I always tell people, the reason I tell you here's 10 options is 
I don't know which one's going to work. And I, I've learned over uh -huh. time that none of them work every time, all the time, but all of them work some of the time. And so yeah, if, well put. if we choose all 10, one of them's bound to work. <laughs> yeah, yeah, good point. <laughs> and good it might point. be different every day. So do all 10 of them daily and whatever one works, high five yourself and move forward. <laughs> <laughs> no, that's well put. I also think this is a value of, of depth psychotherapy, yeah. especially, or, or meditation, you know, or any uh, concerted way or, or discipline that helps people to be more present mm -hmm. to their thoughts, feelings, body sensations, intuitions, imaginings. Um, it, it, those provide people a kind of staging ground where they are able to stay with, increasingly stay with, uh, an ability to, to risk, whether it's a risk in uh, relationship to someone else or in um, just being able to be with one's anxiety for a little longer to see what's there. Again, that, those can all provide a, a kind of base from which to feel more free in the day-to-day -day world because one has practiced that. I often tell students that in many ways, depth psychotherapy is a staging ground for the sense of awe because one has become acutely familiar with being humbled to the max, you know, crushed uh, because that's, what you are supported to stay with and work with is those scariest moments and parts of oneself or, or, the, or the most uh, painful parts of oneself, but also at the same time supported to the max to take risks to, uh, let's say, um, use one's imagination or... Uh, express oneself to another person, let's say the therapist. Or if one is feeling sadness, maybe to notice and to be more sensitive of, about the world and, and to feel very warm feelings and caring feelings as well as these hurtful or sorrowful feelings. Or if one is angry, uh, it could also help one to experience a sense of standing up in the world and asserting oneself. Um, the, the point being that all these difficult feelings have flip sides and can often lead to uh, a, an experience of the wider range, you know, of who we are and an ability to uh, to stay with the wider range of who we are day to day so that we can live more fully, basically. I like that. Speaking, circling back to you, what's a moment mm -hmm. that made you feel incredibly humble over the years? Well, I mean, the first that comes to mind is that death, but uh, certainly a recognition of the power of my subconscious mind. Mm -hmm. um, I, I had later occasions to experience some pretty uh, anxious moments uh, later on in graduate school, being a psychologist, being challenged to work with uh, you know, very extreme people uh, in places like, uh, you know, psychiatric emergency centers and state hospitals and places like that. Mm -hmm. It got me in touch with some of my own fears that still had not been worked through. And so uh, I, I had some 
some very tough uh, times. Uh, just, well, being opened to like too much possibility yeah. and uh, too much of imagination. So uh, it, it gave me, I think, a very healthy appreciation for the power of consciousness. Mm. And I say healthy because I, I did eventually learn to stay with a lot of those anxious feelings and work through them with some very good therapeutic support and support through my studies and colleagues and so on. Uh, but uh, I also realize that these things are not easy often and that, and that they do take some time and that they take practice. And it's, it's helpful to have some kind of practice or discipline to build up, it's like building up muscles, you know, to build up the the strength, the capacity to, uh, again, be in touch with uh, the wider ranges uh, of one's thoughts, feelings, sensations, imaginings. Uh, and I'm also certainly been humbled being a, a father and a, a husband and um, it's it's helped to open me up to you know feelings I, I would not have otherwise had mm -hmm. uh, being in, in such an you know intimate relationships mm. uh, that's true that's I, true I mean, yeah. Here's but a question. Certainly. Yeah, go ahead. I think it'll fit well with the topic. What's been your most awe-inspiring moment? Yeah, that's that's a great question. Uh I I got to put uh my son's birth right up there. Mm. And I presided by it and uh, actually uh, cut the cord <laughs> at, at his birth. But that was incredible. Um, and moments afterward, I just sort of intuitively took him to the window in the hospital and kind of held him up to the sky and the cityscape below. And, uh, just uh, welcomed him uh, and felt a very, very much a flow, you know, with what I wondered, he, you know, he was experiencing and the kind of connection with a, a wide open life now mm. and possibilities for him in in that life and my just great feelings of love for uh, what I and we could do to, uh, you know, bring this life into its, its fullest uh, realization. Uh, certainly that is great awe. I experience a great sense of awe certainly in a love love relationship with with my wife uh, with moments I mean I remember the moment where I fell in love with her I, I don't mm -hmm. have to go into detail but that certainly was an awe-inspiring moment mm -hmm. that just had to do with at that moment a, a glance at her sitting in a in a chair in in uh, Martha's Vineyard believe it or not uh, in a bed and breakfast place. Uh, some of it's mysterious, you know, It's but uh, that was awesome because uh, it's like I shifted from really liking her and we were close to, to this cosmic leap into something that has continued to last now for 35 years. Wow. Uh, 
uh, very special. The ocean, the ocean is another place where I feel that sense of awe and being connected with my friend or you know my son when we're enjoying we're playing in the ocean and you know whether it's boogie boarding or body surfing or what have you Hmm. traveling too i definitely feel it and in my field you know some wonderful i've had the privilege to be at some wonderful venues and conferences and presentations and experience the audience in in those deeply resonant ways where we're feeling a flow or a connection uh, I, guess, I guess it's sort of big things or somehow can, can be small moments, but they're connected to something much bigger. Hmm. That, that's when I often experience that sense of awe. Very and nice. I can open to that. Very nice. What about your greatest fear? You know, I... May sound strange after all that I've told you, but probably the the, the unknown. <laughs> um, I would I would say infinity, really. I mean, if you want to kind of bring it down to brass tacks, I, uh, the the notion of something that's endless and has no boundary, whatever, uh, as radically radically unknown and mysterious is both fascinating and terrifying to me at Mm -hmm. at the same time Uh, probably to many people I I agree I think it's part of what makes it so fascinating is that element of the edge that exists with it of the unknown the part that lights us up that allows our imagination the faith and the fear to both wander in all directions to, to really just not know um, it's a space. Well, yeah, it's a space I found a lot of people aren't quite comfortable in that space. There's some that thrive in it, but, m- yeah. but many people shy away from it. That's right, and I think they end up missing out a a lot of you know the the ex- excitement of living. Mm-hmm. But it's uh, but it's understandable. Um, I mean, it's it's such such an ironic thing that you know that which is that which is without boundary is uncontained is also the place where we're freest. <laughs> That's right. You know. Yeah. That's right. What and about? I, I guess I feel like we we all exist on a spectrum of being able to deal with that. It's true. Cool. It's true. I, I think what's interesting is in some categories of people's lives, they're radically comfortable with it, but then mm-hmm. you switch categories and they're a risk taker and an adventure seeker and they find right. peace in the unknown, but then you switch yeah. categories to their life and oh boy, they're addicted to certainty. <laughs> yes, that is so true. That is so true. And I, a, I think that's really, that shows up with like clay-footed gurus sometimes. Ah, yep. Or, you know, teachers that... They're great in certain areas, and they they're so freeing and and so inspiring. But then you put them in certain other circumstances, and it's like, oh boy. Yep. I noticed. They're I noticed this rigid concept. Or whatever. I noticed this concept in myself. There was a, a book written recently by a lady at uh, Stanford, I believe, Carol Dweck. She wrote about mindset, uh-huh. the fixed mindset or the growth mindset. And when I took the quiz the first time. I was thinking about the way I approach travel and love and relationships. And I was like, oh, I'm totally growth mindset. And then when I I sat down and analyzed different parts of my life, and when I got to business, I noticed my brain would do many things that qualified for the fixed mindset list. And I was like, well, hey, that's not, that's <laughs> not going to be useful in the long run. And so right. I remember having to think through and work through, well, how do I transition this one category of my life over to the growth yeah. mindset? Because yes. overall, you know, if I gave myself a whole human rating, I'm probably 80% growth mindset. But I uh-huh. found those little uh-huh. 20% of myself that's like, uh, 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 not today. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. And I had to do yeah. the work and nudge it over. <laughs> yep, yep. No, that's, well, that's key. I mean, I think being uh, present or 
noticing, mm. trying to, to, to really notice what's operating. Mm-hmm. And when, when those places come up, those narrow places. Mm-hmm. And yeah, that's really humbling. You're right. And uh, yeah, I sure get hit with that <laughs> in certain areas. <laughs> they, definitely. They sneak up on you. They do. They do. But so, but they're instructive. And that's, I mean, to me, that that's part of the, the wonder and the awe of living, too, is that it's a continually unfolding uh, road. Uh, I mean, would we want to have it any other way? Otherwise, in a sense, it would be closed off. You know, you'd reach the end and you'd have it all set and settled and where's the adventure (laughs) from there where's the discovery the vulnerability it seems like you need vulnerability to to be uh, to follow the all path in a way that's right that's right okay my next question what are you most excited about for your future Well, hopefully having my health, for one thing. As, as you get older, that does uh, become more than just a <laughs> kind of tired adage. <laughs> but, uh, yeah, I, I'm excited about what fields I'll be exploring next. Uh, mm. And that has something to do with writing. I'm still exploring this sense of awe. I find it so enriching. And I, uh, I've been applying it to uh, sort of cultural and political situations more and more and how it could help me and us as a society to uh, relate in a more humane way mm. with each other. Mm. And that's a lot of my concern. I know it's a lot of people's concern right now is, you know, the sense of, stereotyping and devaluation and thingification we're getting into uh, with each other, uh, reducing each other to these these narrow identities and so on, and not being able to uh, be more fully present, face-to-face, person-to-person, whole person-to-whole person with each other, which I think is a very important road uh, to, you know, a more civil and growthful society. And it would be based in part on, you know, cultivating this sense of awe, this sense of humility about oneself and even one's culture or one's identities. And wonder, and humility does allow for wonder because it kind of gets you out of the way and gets your prejudices out of the way as much as possible to be able to wonder about the other and and all that that other could bring to your life and what you could bring mutually to each other's lives. Uh, I mean, Martin Buber has this wonderful the philosopher, a wonderful idea of the I-thou relationship, uh, which is basically an ability to be yourself as much as possible, but also meet the other Hmm. and be open to what the other has to say and to convey. Uh, And in a mutual connection, as opposed to the I-it relationship, where you're relating to the other as an object, hmm. whether it's an object of use, you know, for, let's say, some commercial purposes per se, or profiteering, or or, or whatever it is, if, if it's a very... I'm not saying those things are all bad, but if they're not part of a larger uh, sense of life, I think they could be very devitalizing in the long term. Mm. And certainly in, in their extremes, they're, they lead to tyrannies and, and totalitarianisms. Mm. I can see that. I can see that. 
Well, this has been quite the conversation. <laughs> I have. I've, I've actually. I've, I've really enjoyed it. Thank you. Oh, thank you. I really, really appreciated the the way you've uh, evoked. Uh, I think the the depth of our conversation. Mm. So I have one final question. Well, two. The first is, if we could leave everyone with one actionable, tangible tip that they can go out and apply immediately to start to experience some more awe and wonder and adventure in their life, what mm -hmm. would that tip be? I would say to... Try to tune in, whatever it is you're doing or whoever it is you're with, to tune in to the realization of the passing nature of time and life mm. and how, how quickly it's, it's going by and, and, and to know that this moment will never be replicated again. Uh, you, you cannot duplicate it. And in fact, uh, these moments you're having are finite. They are going to end mm -hmm. at some point. How are you going to live them with those realizations? Mm -hmm. the, the question of how are you willing to live is key. Mm. I love that. So, try to keep that in mind. How are you willing to live in this moment, given that it's all passing? I love that. I love that. How are you going to choose to live in this moment? Yeah. Well, Kirk, sir, it's been a pleasure. We're going to make sure to gather the links where people can access your book and, and come and find more about you. We're going to make sure they're in the show notes of this episode. So if you're tuning in and listening and you've enjoyed what you heard, Make sure to go to the show notes, click the links, and we'll make sure to direct you over to where you can find out more about Kirk and all that he's up to, as well as grab a copy of his book. And sir, would you mind saying the title one more time for everyone? Sure. It's The Spirituality of Awe, A-W-E, Challenges to the Robotic Revolution. Perfect. And we'll be able to send traffic. We'll, we'll find it online with you and link it up so that you can go to the show notes, click the link, go directly to it, and, and grab a copy for yourself. Grab a copy for a, a group that you read with or a friend that needs to hear this message. Uh, we believe that sharing is caring, so make sure to share and spread this to the people who need to hear it the most. And, and thank you all again for tuning in, and we look forward to seeing you all next episode. 